Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here in this workshop today. And I'm also happy to say that many of the things I would have liked to cover have already been um, on the table. Um, but I would like to focus on online privacy for now. Um, at Ethicus, we are really worried about responsible innovation and in particular about the trade-offs that we are doing in terms of privacy versus security versus um, um, other fundamental rights. So um, I'm sure that there's no need for me to explain why online privacy matters. I mean, we all know in this room that privacy matters, uh, but in particular, um, online uh, life and identities and communications are um, posing threats to, to privacy. So this is just a joke, but it's, I mean, it's helpful to understand, uh, oops, sorry, no, too fast. It's helpful to understand that if, if this kind of egg is our privacy, uh, this is how our privacy looks when we are online. So this is funny, <laughs> but I mean, it, it's like to grasp the general idea in just, in, in just, a, just a picture. Uh, the thing is that in a context of ubiquity surveillance that some of us have named um, our era like this, um, privacy is a human right but also uh, a fundamental right, but it also the, the door for other uh, fundamental rights as we have been mentioning uh, before. I would like to mention the book uh, uh, by Robert McChesney, which, which is called Digital Disconnect, and basically is um, explaining how capitalism and by extension OSPs um, are turning the internet against democracy. And I would also like to point how this is um, Endangering, endangering or jeopardizing um, freedom of speech, particularly. And that's, oh, sorry. I'm pressing this, sorry. Yes. Um, so I would like to mention also a report made by uh, the PN uh, one year ago, which was actually studying to what extent there was like a chilling effect. Pro pro produced by this massive surveillance that was discovered or put on the table after the Snowden revelations. And actually what they found out, they were interviewing, oh, I don't know what's happening here. Um, they were finding that th their main thing was that they actually found that writers and journalists were changing their minds regarding which kind of um, ideas they would like to explore, they would like to develop in order to avoid to be um, surveilled, targeted, okay? So, um, as for example, they found that one in six writers have avoided writing or speaking on a topic, on a specific topic, because they thought that if they did, they would be subject to, to surveillance. Being that said, um, I would like to, sorry for the Google guy, I will mention <laughs> your company, okay. Um, there are much more, but <laughs> there are much more, um, but I would like to use this, this I don't know, it's kind of, well, uh, I would like to use this both because I think that it's, again, it, one image that makes us um, think that OSPs are something like big eyes on our little issues. Um, so um, I think that at this point, um, the bulk of, or the words, the concepts that we are using are interesting to, to understand how we shape reality that is coming. So uh, we speak about uh, online ser service providers as monopolies, but on the other side, we don't know whether to use exactly if we need to speak about users or um, consumers, because the transaction thing that uh, the, the previous speaker was mentioning has been like blow off. But of course, we need to speak about data subjects because to some extent, the OSPs are seeing consumers, users, blah, blah, as data subjects. But for sure, these data subjects in the end are citizens that also are right holders. So this is just to mention that the we need to be aware and probably we would need to put forward a discussion about which kind of terms are we using when we, when we refer to the individuals that are using these, these services. So again, a little picture um, about uh, OSP monopolies and the thing that we need to be aware that we, sorry, the product, um, 
are like these pigs in the in the picture. I don't know if you can read it, but uh, the name of the of the cartoon is pigs talking about the free model. And one pig says, "Isn't it great? We have to pay nothing for the barn." And the other says, "Yeah, and even the food is free, but they are pigs, and we know that what's going to happen after <laughs> they eat all this barn and and so on." So I think that it's pretty pretty important to keep in mind and probably to bring to the public opinion the discussion about who is the product and, and which are the transaction terms on this because otherwise we come to this uh, sort of thing like this and if you take a look a closer look at it um, I would invite you to discuss um, whether consumers or um, yeah, consumers, buyers have this rational choice that has been uh, discussed before, and to what extent do they have the power to um, to to choose? So the next thing to move on is that okay, we have these OSP, which are private actors, and what about governments? So thanks to Snowden and other whistleblowers and other people um, announcing it, we know that. Governments are really, really happy to have these OSPs collecting all that information because, as, as has been uh, said before, I'm really sorry because my presentation is like too smart today and too fast. So um, I was saying that governments are really happy because they have access to important that that can be important information at some point um, that otherwise they would have never had access to. So. We totally understand why these also companies are, are um, storing these, all these bunches of data uh, just in case, just in case someday we can understand what happened, just in case someday we can pick something that reveals, I don't know, whatever secret. Okay, so in the end, we find that governments have no problem with OSPs gathering all this information, said in broad terms. And in fact, they are promoting backdoors. So the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation that has been mentioned before as well, every year um, publishes like a report, which is um, a simple table, like assessing the different attitudes again uh, towards backdoors um, regarding governments for different for the main companies. And every year they add some some more. And the dimensions that they take into account are. Uh, to what extent that company, the given company, follows industry accepted best practices, uh, to what extent they tell users about government data demand, so in terms of basically uh, transparency um, attitudes, to what extent uh, they disclose policies on data retention, which for me is like the great forgotten thing, because we are always speaking about um, which data is collected and blah, 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 but who is holding that data, for how long is this data stored, and, and, and so on. Um, also, to what extent these companies disclose government content removal requests, and for me the most important is how much these companies are pro -use, um, de defense pro-user public policy and then uh, opposes um, backdoors. And to follow, uh, one of the things that Zuckerberg gave us to think of is he announced that we were like in an era which was the end of privacy. And I think that today we can be happy to say that it's not the end of privacy in, um, actually, but it depends on the user. And this is dangerous and I will explain now why. So if, uh, if we take a look at this little um, fact there, uh, this is Mm, retrieved from a peer research center um, uh, report and after the Snowden revelations they were asking um, to what extent people was changing their online behaviors. I'm sure you might know uh, the, the privacy paradox which says basically that we are terrified for the things that are happening with our data there but, but actually we are not doing anything to uh, defend ourselves uh, or to protect ourselves better. So basically they were asking to what extent it's difficult or easy to protect yourself in front of these situations and they found that more, more of the half uh, of the people, so 54% uh, found it somewhat difficult or very difficult to protect themselves. So this is a problem in terms of freedom of choice. Okay, um, And then we start to see um, more or less funny alternatives that are called surveillance self-defense, which 
again for me is a problem because a fundamental right it's not a matter of how uh, individuals want to be defended or not or, or, or to what extent the individuals have the right to have this right they are right holders by definition uh, regardless their their awareness on, on on the thing so in the end it is all this is to explain that the burden is put on the user and we are not paying too much attention to it. So we have transparency recommendations, proportionality, informed consent, and blah, blah. But this is not enough at this point, because it still depends on the user and how the user is able and resilient um, toward this. And let me mention an example. It's not about uh, an OSP as a uh, case, but it's about uh, a health data case, which I think that uh, it's also another important um, field. And it was a case of the um, personal genome project. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, but it was like a massive, massive project to um, gather information about genomics and to produce open data in order to, to foster um, health, um, health research on that field. And they were really proud about their informed consent policy. The informed consent policy had um, 19 pages so, sorry, the privacy policy had 19 pages, which is often the case. Um, but they didn't want people to use like the whatever button. So they, w they really wanted to people to be really aware of what were they signing before they were joining the project, because this was uh, like a voluntary um, action. And they came up with a, with a really funny idea, which was that any individual willing to become part of the project was expected to take an exam. And guess what? They had to take 100% uh, of the questions right in order to join it. So this is, again, it's a joke, but this, this was real. And of course, they were really concerned because they, they were, they were uh, worried about people knowing what to become part of this project, which in the end was to be open data for research meant. But the worst thing after the exam of the 100% um, marks was that four years after, four years after, from the Harvard University, um, a team of, of not hackers, but uh, people that could be like sitting in a room, like in your, in your faculty um, neighbors, the fact is that 40% of the sample was re-identified four years after. And they were only using gender, zip code, and date of birth, year of birth, I think. And of course, peop that people, um, passed the exam with 100%, but in the end, they were not anonymous uh, at all. So this was also a problem of privacy. And again, uh, for me, it's dangerous that the responsibility is on the user, because I think that it's like a driver for inequality reproduction. So um, which are the arguments that people use to say, no, I'm not doing anything extra. I'm not putting any effort uh, to protect myself, because one, I have nothing to hide. And then we have Snowden saying, arguing that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide. It's not different than saying that you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. It's crystal clear. Other excuses or other arguments, other reasons for not protecting f um, their, their data is I do not have the time or expertise, which is pretty common. It won't prevent monitoring anyway, so I accept this. Uh, I don't want to raise suspicions or invite scrutiny which I think it's even worse. And I'm, comfor I'm comfortable with the monitoring because it makes, a, it makes us safer, which is the um, privacy versus uh, security trade-off. And to show some implications of this inequalities reproduction, uh, we have the European Commission have some data on this, and there are still 20% of EU citizens that have never used the internet, so we still have an important um, digital divide. Um, not everyone has uh, access to the same broadband uh, level and of course there are huge differences between urban areas and rural areas but also there are differences in terms of age, gender and also cultural resources that it's directly translated into capacity um, for resilience. So this is like the first consequence, the first important consequence of um, putting the, barter, the burden um, onto the user. The second thing uh, I would like to mention before finishing is the new privacy economies that are flourishing after after that. And we can have like four different models, two for OSPs and two uh, on the individual side. 
Regarding our space, we have this, the corporate social responsibilities that have already been mentioned, but we also have the privacy as a commodity model. So this is the case of AT&T, for instance, that if you, if you uh, I think that one year ago, they offered um, a fee uh, that you were provided with broadband, and if you didn't want to be um, surveilled, you, you, have to pay, you had to pay like $15 more or something like that which is nothing, maybe, but it's $15 yet for, for a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. So, and probably you go directly to the list of those who don't want to be followed. You know? So um, I think that it's interesting to know that this is like a, some of the models that are um, emerging. On the individual side, we have like two positions. One is, okay, I don't mind. If my data can be useful for something, I will give it away. That's the case for data um, altruist. But also there's people that say, oh, okay, are you making profit with my data? I will make profit with my data. So I know that, I don't know, my, ba my banking records are worth $10 per year, so I will earn it instead of you. So uh, we start to see individuals that are starting to trade with their personal data. And the drivers behind uh, these new privacy economies and, and, and the dynamics behind uh, are different. So, for instance, we can think that after uh, or behind corporate social responsibility, we, we, we see the aim of regaining trust. Uh, when we speak about privacy as a commodity, we are speaking about setting new privileges and, again, new cleavages and, again, new inequalities. On the individual side, we can, we can think about generosity when we, when we speak to a data altruist and the profit uh, of the of the people trading with with their um, data, so then what? Because I've I've said many many things and exposed my worries, uh, but to to sum up, um, we need to accept that the communication revolution is here to stay, and OSPs will be here to stay. And if they are monopolies, they will try to still be monopolies in 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 ter in ten years. But of course, we have a systemic change, I'm speaking about systemic change, not systemic failure, maybe, but of course it's something that uh, it's multi-level and that has uh, ethical, legal and social implications. So I think that it's, it's not a matter of a single solution. So individual or par partial solutions um, are insufficient. And at Ethicus, what we're exploring now are um, to what extent can we develop social technical architectures? And by these women, um, a joint uh, strategy between the political arena, economical arena, technical arena, and also, and also uh, social arena. So these systemic threats require systemic solutions that might include uh, encry encryption mechanisms, of course, uh, enforcement of transparency, accountability, uh, methodologies for assessment, um, grievance mechanisms, privacy by design, privacy enhancing technologies, uh, and accurate um, protocols for data mate for data management. And of course, um, we're convinced that for promoting uh, responsible innovation, further discussion is needed. And of course, inviting the public to um, discuss all these, uh, all these issues on the public domain, we also think that it's really, really important. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs>